Hi, I'm Kathy Sakuda, and I'm the program co-chair along with Adam Almeida, who is our featured speaker this evening. Adam is very humble. He sent me his bio bib, and it's really short. He wants you to know that he is a college student from Kailua, Hawaii, getting his degree in natural science. He has been surrounded by orchids and anthuriums for most of his life, but started to seriously get interested in orchids after joining the Honolulu Orchid Society in the spring of 2016. Since then, he has joined nearly all of the other societies. He hopes his passion for orchids will lead him to a career where he can continue to learn. In addition, he is a, he, he was a student judge and is now a regular judge, right, Mel? Pro, probationary judge. Oh, he's a probationary judge. And so he is very serious about uh, his interest. So he has a passion for orchids. And what impressed me about Adam is that he is a very humble and likable guy who, who never says no. He always helps the society in any way he, he can. And uh, he is, his youthfulness belies his, his knowledge regarding orchids and plants. So without further ado, here is Adam Almeida, and he will be sharing with you that you too can grow orchids. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Um, so I'm just going to be sharing a <clears throat> very informal presentation on some species orchids that I have been able to bloom and keep alive over the course of the pandemic. and. So I'll be sharing information and photographs that I've taken of my plants um, because that's what we've been doing over the course of the pandemic, right? We've been photographing our plants um, with an emphasis on that you can grow these plants because if I can grow them, you can grow them. Don't count on it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so species orchids that you can grow. The first species that we'll be talking about, and this is going to be in alphabetical order, uh, is Arandina graminifolia, otherwise known as the grass-like leaved Arandina, or here we know it as the bamboo orchid. Um, this plant is originally from Southeast Asia, I, I think the Philippines, um, and at this point, you can find this plant uh, just about anywhere um, on the islands in, in, in the state, but especially uh, on the big island. Um, they're a very easy plant to grow. They bloom kind of freely uh, as long as it's not in the winter time. Um, the flowers are self-compatible, so you will often get seed pods arising from this plant. And their seeds are generalist when it comes to mycorrhizae. Um, so they kind of just, they, they can pop up without having a specific uh, fungus needed. Um, and in Hawaii, they're considered high risk under the weed risk assessment system. So not great to propagate this plant. Next, we have Brassavola nodosa, otherwise known as the Nobby Brassavola. Uh, and the Lady of the Night. Uh, this can be found widespread throughout Central and South America. It's an easy growing uh, or, uh, epiphytic orchid that is tolerant of various light levels and temperatures. Um, I've seen images of this plant growing in all kinds of different uh, conditions. I've seen it in pretty deep shade and I've seen it, seen pictures of it growing on the beach. Um, so it's pretty salt tolerant for an orchid, uh, which is a beneficial trait for Hawaii. Um, 
and the the flowers are wonderfully fragrant at night uh sometimes sickeningly so i know uh Roy Tokunaga has complained about the fragrance uh, getting stuck in his car when transporting these plants in the evening. Next is Bulbophyllum blume, uh, one of my favorite Bulbophyllums that I grow. It's known as Bloom's Bulbophyllum, who is some old dead guy. Uh, this plant can be found in Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, and Australia. And it has small rambling growths with that are topped with a single leaf. Um, it's a very easy plant to grow. It likes the hot and humid conditions that are present in Kailua. And it blooms several times a year, at least twice with a good flush. But it also grow, uh, blooms sporadically with one or two flowers throughout the year as well. Um, easily makes cuttings. I. Uh, chopped a bunch of pieces off of this plant about two years ago for a Windward Orchid Society. And uh, I know I saw the one at Walters still growing, so that's a good sign. This is Bulbophyllum mirum, uh, meaning the enchanting Bulbophyllum. It's found in Sabah, Borneo, Sumatra, Java, Flores, Bali, and Peninsular Malaysia. Uh, this bulbophyllum is even smaller in, in vegetative size as well as flower size than um, bulbophyllum blume. Uh, its leaves are actually quite small and it, it likes uh, lower light than the blume likes. <clears throat> it always blooms with these twin flowers that kind of look like a miniature bulbophyllum frosty eye flowers. Uh, I call them clogs. They kind of look like shoes. Um, the, the, they're supposed to be fragrant as well, but they're so small and they don't bloom with too many at a time. I've never been able to uh, detect the fragrance. Um, but you can kind of see these little filaments coming out from underneath the dorsal sepal, and it has these little hairs that blow in the wind underneath there very attractive flower. This is Calanthe vestida. Uh, most of us are probably familiar with this. H&R uh, sells it, I know that. This is where this plant is from. Uh, it means the Calanthe that is surrounded by bracts. It can be found in Myanmar, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Sumatra, Borneo, and Sulawesi. This plant likes warm to hot temperatures and bright shade. It's this particular one that I have photographed here is the white form, which is supposed to be the most common. Uh, there is also a, a full violet color form, which is really, really nice, and several uh, color forms that are a combination of the white and violet color form. Um, Calanthe vestida and all Calanthes actually are uh, deciduous orchids that go through that need a winter rest in order to bloom in the spring. Uh, it's a little more shocking to see this one uh, rest than it is, say, like the Honohonos or something like that, because the leaves dramatically die and fall off, and they're big leaves too. And it, then you're all all you're left is left with is some big pseudobulbs, and the the spike will start before the new growth starts. So you'll just have pseudobulbs with a nice spike coming out and no, no leaves. Selogeny pandorata, uh, the violin or lute shaped selogeny. This is from Malaysia, Sumatra, Borneo, and the Philippines. Uh, if any of you are growing this, it's probably in bloom right now or just finished bloom blooming. Uh, I know mine was blooming last week. Uh, it's a very easy plant to grow. It likes, you know, bright shade. I grow it with the anthuriums uh, and hot temperatures. And it's a big plant. Uh, can get very big very quickly. Uh, and an interesting thing about this plant is if you look at the lip, 
you can see the dark markings on the lip. And because of that, it was once considered a, a black orchid. Um, this was many, many decades ago, uh, as now we have hybrids of Catacetinae that blow this out of the water in terms of black orchids. Uh, but it's still the, the black contrasting with the light green on this flower is very attractive. And it also has a nice uh, fragrance to it as well. Uh, but the flowers are, they only last about a week. <clears throat> it's time to go. Why are you next to the way I'm trying? Um, Sinorchus fastigiata. Uh, the specific name refers to the blooming habit of the plant. It refers to the, the flower uh, arrangement. And it's called, if, if Eddie is here and he can pronounce that, that would be awesome. But I'm going to do my best. Sofinampori in Madagascar. Um, and it can be found in the Seychelles, the Mascarenes, and Madagascar. So in that area, those are all islands right next to each other. Um, it likes cool to hot temperatures and variable light levels. Honestly, it's a too easy to grow. It's a weed. Uh, it, it has gotten loose in my collection and now it pops up in pots all over the place. Um, it's another one of those plants like Arandina graminifolia that easily pollinates and, and makes seed pods and those seed pods uh, readily set uh, start new plants. So I've got at least four of these spread throughout the greenhouse right now. But they do make an attractive flower and they don't spread that quickly. So it's not too bad. <clears throat> Dendrobium vigibum, or the two-humped dendrobium, has a lot of names, also known as the Cooktown orchid and the mauve butterfly orchid. Uh, this species is found naturally in northern Queensland up into Papua New Guinea. It's got a very limited range for a dendrobium. Um, actually, I, I, maybe not. Uh, but it's, that is a very small range from northern Queensland to Papua New Guinea. Um, it likes warm to hot temperatures and ideally very bright shade. I'm, I know I'm not growing this in enough light. It doesn't bloom as well as it could. Uh, but it's, you got to be careful. Um, the flowers are long lasting, but this plant, uh, like many other dendrobiums, needs a, a winter rest from water and fertilizer in order to bloom well in the spring. Uh, but then you're re rewarded with these ridiculously large flowers for the size of the plant. And <clears throat> when the plant gets more mature and more healthy, it'll bloom and it's also the floral emblem of Queensland, uh, Australia. I wish our orchids were so nice that we could make them our emblem. This is Dendrobium biloculare, uh, the two-eyed Dendrobium. It's going to be found in Western New Guinea, specifically near Etna Bay. So very, very small range to find this plant. Um, it likes warm temperatures and dappled light. And it likes a real slight reduction of water and fertilizer um, during the winter until the new growth emerges in the spring and then back to regular conditions. Uh, like all, just about all other Latoria dendrobiums, it blooms beneath the leaves for the most part. The, the spikes can start above the leaves, but always end up holding the flowers beneath. Um, and you can see why it was it's named the two-eyed dendrobium, because if you look at the flowers, they do kind of look like bloodshot eyes, um, if you use your imagination a little bit. Um, interestingly, this, <clears throat> this species was first described in 1904 near Etna Bay, but wasn't uh, seen in the wild again until 1996. So it went nearly 100 years without being seen in the wild. Um, thankfully, it didn't go extinct because this is a very, very attractive uh, dendrobium, in my opinion. I very much enjoy the green flowers.
This is Dendrobium unicum, known as the unique Dendrobium. It can be found in Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, and Thailand. Uh, this is a very, very unique species. Uh, the, the plant is pretty small, but it blooms with these large, showy flowers that are bright orange. And it doesn't just bloom a little bit, it flushes with blooms when it blooms. Um, I remember Tom Miranda had a monstrous one at the Hilo show, uh, the last show that they put on before the pandemic. I still have a picture of that on my phone. It was so nice. Um, and it's <clears throat> a, a deciduous dendrobium, very similar to Honohono. It needs a winter rest uh, from water and fertilization, and then it'll bloom in the spring with these flowers. Um, they last longer than I expected. This was the first bloom uh, on these plants, and, and uh, it's I've still got flowers on it that are looking nice. So it's a good plant, and it's a miniature. Uh, so that's good for us local growers since we're always hurting for space. Most of these plants that I've shown are miniatures. I think the only ones that aren't would be like Selogeny pandorata and the bamboo orchid. Uh, this is Diplocolobium kirchianum. Uh, it's known currently as Dendrobium kirchianum, but I, I figured I had enough Dendrobiums. Um, it's from the humid lowlands of New Guinea, and New Guinea has dozens and dozens of species of Diplocolobium that are endemic and vary only slightly. Um, but they're all really attractive. They're, they have small growths, miniature growths that form mats rather quickly, and they, they bloom f frequently. I, I know this blooms kind of at least twice a year. Um, typically solitary flowers. Uh, occasionally you'll get uh, two coming out of the same point, but most often it's one. Um, and they, they bloom or they grow really easily. If you got them mounted on something where they dry out every day and you water every day, they grow very, very quickly. And will reward you with blooms as soon as they can. This is Gastrochylus japonicus, uh, the Gastrochylus from Japan, the yellow pine orchid, Kashinoki ran, and I'm not gonna try on that one because I'm, I know I'm gonna say it wrong. Um, it's from Southern Japan to Taiwan, uh, and this is a, another really, really attractive miniature orchid. Um, it's got a vendaceous uh, growth habit. Um, the flowers are rather large flowers put out in a compact inflorescence below the leaves. Um, the flowers are, have a really nice citrusy fragrance, uh, sometimes described as a pine fragrance. That's why it's known as one of the reasons why it's known as the yellow pine orchid. Um, and if you look closely on the lip of these flowers, you can see they even have a pouch in the labellum. Um, this, this is a very, very attractive plant uh, and not terribly difficult to grow. Um, I, I have it mounted on cork with sphagnum and it, I water when it's dry and it, it blooms pretty frequently. Um, and in, in nature, it can be found on branches and trunks of pines and broadleaf trees. So that's the other reason why it's called the yellow pine orchid. Um, yeah, if you can find Gastrochylus japonicus, I recommend growing it. It's a very, very cute plant to grow. Uh, Guarianthi boringiana. This is the cerulea variety of this species. Um, it is endemic to Guatemala and Belize, so it can only be found in those countries, uh, typically. Um, it can be found growing on rocky cliffs and ravines near streams, which is a uh, 
typical environment for many Cattleya species uh, in, in South America. I know um, the Rapiculus uh, Cattleyas grow in areas like that too, but just with a little more sun exposure. Um, this is a easy growing species. I know it's grown by many, many of our members. Um, and a, a similar species was actually um, our, or was it a Boringiana that was best in show last year, Brad, or at, at the last HOS? I forget. It, Skinner Eye and Boringiana are very similar, and it was one of those. Um, and it was a huge plant. Um, and uh, interestingly, this plant does need a winter rest uh, in order to bloom properly. Not as distinct as some of the dendrobiums, but still a, a, a slight reduction. Um, and this plant was a rescue I got from Kolau Farmers when I just started. Uh, and now it blooms with at least three spikes every year. Maxillaria cameridii, or the cameridium-like maxillaria, um, very descriptive name. Uh, it's found throughout Northern South America. It's found in most of the countries in, in, in the upper part of South America. Um, it's a transient bloomer. It, it, I'm fairly certain that it blooms similarly to Dendrobium cruminatum, uh, where its blooms are initiated by a uh, barometric pressure shift. Um, it just, it doesn't seem as sensitive as cruminatum. Uh, it doesn't bloom as frequently as Dendrobium cruminatum does, but it's just as easy growing. Um, <clears throat> it, it likes to be mounted. It likes to ramble. Um, so if you can find this plant, I recommend getting it. It's also, I believe it had a nice fragrance the last time I, I bloomed it. Um, the only unfortunate thing is that the flowers last exactly a day and then they, they senesce. Um, but very attractive flowers with the yellow lip on them and the, the pure white, uh, petals and sepals. Myrmecophila tibicinus, the trumpet or flute-like myrmecophila. Uh, if you didn't know, myrmecophila means ant-loving, um, and they have that name because myrmecophilas have a symbiotic relationship with ants in their natural habitat. Uh, myrmecophilas have long, hollow pseudobulbs that have an opening at the bottom that ants will enter in and make their nests inside of. And the, the food and uh, droppings that the ants make serve as fertilizer uh, for the plant and the plant serves as protection. Um, it can be found in Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, Costa Rica, Venezuela, and Colombia. It's a, this is, if you have space concerns, this is not the plant for you. Um, this particular plant that I grow is from Linda Leong, um, and it's about two and a half feet wide. And when it blooms, it sends spikes about, I think the tallest I got was six and a half feet so far, but that was at, from the top of the growth. So the, the spikes get very, very tall and make it very difficult to photograph. Um, but it's a very rewarding plant and it grows very easily here. I've seen them mounted on coconut trees in Kailua and bloom and they bloom, you know. Um, and th they do have fragrant flowers, but you, you'd need a ladder to, to smell them. Um, but very fun plant. Neobenthamia gracilis. Uh, if you look this up, you'll probably end up seeing a different name. It has several, um, but it's known as the grass leaf neobenthamia, and it's endemic to Tanzania, uh, where it can be found growing terrestrially in full sun exposure. Uh, it likes high light and hot temperatures. 
I got this plant several years ago from George and Judy Hedano at the Manoa show. And it was in a, a small ceramic pot in potted in sphagnum and it would dry out within about five hours in the day um it would it, it needed as much water as it could get so eventually i transplanted it to a, a significantly larger plastic pot filled with sphagnum and it kept it more hydrated and now it's attained quite a large size and i've uh taken quite a lot of cakeys off it in the last several years uh so if anybody's interested in growing this, I have some cakeys. Um, and it's easy. You just throw it out into the full sun, water it every day, and it, 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 it can be a landscaping plant, honestly. It just doesn't pollinate its flowers as well as the other ones. So it's probably better. Um, but it mostly blooms all at once uh, in the summer. It doesn't bloom too often. This is Oncidium splendidum, surprisingly the splendid Oncidium. And it's from Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. It's a hot growing lithophyte, which means it grows on rocks and it likes bright shade. Uh, this was the first bloom on this plant. Uh, I have, I've been growing this plant for quite a while. Uh, it's one of the, it's called a mule ear Oncidium. Um, they, they're very particular about the watering they receive. Um, so it was kind of, you know, on a knife's edge for a few years, but I guess I, I kind of figured it out. Um, and it blooms in early spring on an up to four foot long spike holding many large yellow flowers that last several weeks. Um, and I, I fell in love with this plant when it bloomed because of that yellow lip. That solid yellow lip is very, uh, very attractive. Uh, and apparently the bees think it's very attractive too, because while it was in bloom, every time I went out, I would see bees stuck up in the column trying to pollinate the flowers. Uh, Paphiopedalum delinadii. This is a very unique Paphiopedalum species from southern Vietnam. I didn't fix the spelling on. Uh, it's a small sized terrestrial and lithophytic orchid, uh, which can be found in the lowland and highland forests, growing in poor soils, as most uh, Paphiopedalums do. They're like uh, poor soils high in acid, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and this blooms can bloom anytime from December to early spring. And it is one of very few Paphiopedalum species that are fragrant. Uh, it smells kind of like raspberries. Uh, you combine that with the very attractive appearance of the, the flowers with the, the pink labellum and the pure white uh, petals and dorsal sepal. And this is a very, very attractive Paphiopelum species, arguably my favorite. And it's a mottled leaf uh, Paphiopelum too, so warmer temperatures, easier growing for Hawaii. This was one of the, probably the peak of my year so far when it comes to blooming orchids. Uh, Paphiopedalum sukaculii, uh, endemic to Northeastern Thailand. I got this plant from uh, Nuuanu orchids, or yeah, Nuuanu orchids uh, a couple years ago. And the plant grows unbelievably well and vigorously in Kailua, but it hadn't bloomed yet. And it bloomed this year with this nice speckly green flower that I just love. Um, and it, it likes hot to warm temperatures and dappled shade. I grow it in anthurium light and it gets the temperatures I have in Kailua. And it, as I said, loves it. This is another mottled leaf path that uh, likes warmer temperatures. So if you can find this, it's, it's a very rewarding plant. I anticipate next year I'll probably have multiple spikes. Uh, Penalia spicata, the spicate Penalia. Um, most of you, if you have been attending meetings and 
getting giveaway plants probably grow this. It's a, a very, very common here in our collections and grows very, very quickly. Uh, and it adapts to just about any growing condition. Uh, I had some out in very high light for a little bit and was growing others with bulbophyllums in very low light and both were growing just fine. Um, and they easily become large specimens, which is why you see many of these plants being donated for plant giveaways. Um, but they're, they're a fun plant to grow. You don't have to think about them too much and they bloom with these nice tiny crystalline flowers. No fragrance, but uh, very attractive when you have a lot of them together. <clears throat> Pleurothallus alani, which is endemic to central Panama. Uh, this is probably one of the more difficult things to try to grow on this on the list I have. It likes cool to warm temperatures and low light. Um, very attractive to slugs. The soft leaves are, are like candy to them, apparently. Um, and it blooms sporadically. Uh, I'll just go out occasionally and it'll have a flower on it. And it's a great miniature. It it's, fits in the palm of my hand. And uh, interestingly, the leaves, when they're young, are a nice pink color. Uh, and then as they mature, they turn into the green you see. Prostechia radiata is another pretty common plant. It's known as the lined petal prostechia or flor conchita in Mexico. It can be found in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Belize, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, and Venezuela. Uh, it adapts to hot to cool temperatures. Uh, it, it, it grows in a lot of different zones in, in its natural areas. Um, so it's a pretty easy grower. Um, I have two plants that are pretty large and bloom like, uh, and bloom very well every year. Uh, and they're nicely fragrant, um, flowers that last for several weeks. Uh, and, and as you can tell, I got a thing for the green flowers. Um, Stellus argentata or the silvery Stellus. Uh, this, I, my identification of this plant is, I'm not 100% confident in it because to properly identify Stellus, you need to take a microscope to the uh, labellum, which I could do, but I, I don't think it would mean much. Um, it likes hot to cool temperatures and shaded light. Uh, it, bright shade. It's a um, pretty easy plant to grow, and when it does grow, it um, or or when pretty easy plant to bloom, and when it does bloom, it blooms prolifically with many many spikes coming out at once. Uh, they don't last terribly long, and as you can tell, the flowers are extremely tiny, um, and. The species itself is also highly variable. There's a lot of variability in the fl uh, floral characteristics. So it's Stellus, Stellus argentata for now. And this is Thrixpermum centipeda, or the centipede Thrixpermum. Uh, it can be found in China, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Borneo, Java, Sulawesi, Sumatra, and the Philippines. Likes hot to cool temperatures and dappled light. Um, I'm kind of obsessed with this plant right now. It's started blooming for me right at the beginning of the pandemic and hasn't really stopped. Um, it's an interesting plant uh, in that it has these flattened spikes that persist for many years and will rebloom uh, with these spidery looking flowers. Um, and the, the flowers are pleasantly fragrant, uh, but only last for two or three days. Um, but this genus Thrixpermum is a genus that I, ha I have a lot of interest in now. Uh, I have several species that are very interesting, like this Thrixpermum mergwentz. The, or the Mergai uh, Archipelago Thrixpermum. 
which can be found in Myanmar, Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Taiwan, Java, Sumatra, and the Philippines. Um, this is a micro miniature uh, in terms of the Thirk spermums. It's a full size blooming plant and it fits comfortably in the palm of my hand. And I am not a big person. Um, and it blooms with these very, very nice yellow flowers that are non recipient. Um, and just like the centipede, it, uh, the spikes are, are persistent. They'll stay on the plant for, for at least a year at a time and will repeatedly bloom from the same spike. Uh, no, no fragrance on this plant though, but very easy to grow. And then this is Thrixpermum pensil, or the hanging Thrixpermum, from Taiwan, Thailand, Java, Sumatra, and Borneo. Just like the others, it likes warm temperatures and low light. Uh, unlike the others, it has a unique pendulous growth habit, which is what it's named after. Uh, the plant actually grows downwards. Um, so it ne pretty much needs to be mounted to accommodate that growth habit. Uh, I have mine mounted on a, a, a piece of grape wood that happens to accommodate that growth habit pretty well. Um, this was the first bloom on it that I had earlier this year, I believe. And the flowers are short lived. They're not fragrant, but they're very attractive with that nice accent of orange on the lip. And the rest of it is just full white. Um, this is not a uh, plant that has persistent spikes, though. The spikes dried up afterwards. So, But it's a fun plant to grow, very rewarding when it does bloom, but it grows very slowly. So that's something to be warned of. And finally, we have vanilla planifolia, which if any of you, which I know a lot of you are, are in IAEA, uh, you may even have this plant now. Um, it's the flat plain leafed vanilla. It's from the West Indies, Central America, and Northern South America. It likes hot to warm temperatures and low to in intermediate light levels. It'll adapt to different conditions if you do it slowly. Um, the plants grow pretty slow, actually, but they can attain a very large size. Um, I have, we, we grow four plants at my house and all together, they're about the size of a sedan. Um, and uh, this is the plant that you get vanilla uh, flavoring from. You get vanilla beans and vanilla extract from this plant. Um, the flowers bloom for several months in the spring. Each flower only opens for several hours for one day, and you need to hand pollinate it in order to uh, get the seed pods, which will then become vanilla beans. Um, so very lengthy process, but worthwhile if, if you enjoy the flavor of vanilla. It's a nice little project to do. And the vanilla genus is uh, the only genus in orchids that grow on vines. Every species in the genus is a vine. And uh, if you look it up, there's a nice species of vanilla. I believe it's called Draconis or something like that. And it's got a nice colorful, it, it looks very similar to the planifolia flower, but the lip is kind of colorful. It has, uh, I believe, like red or orange in it. Um, but yeah, most of them are pretty mundane looking like the planifolia, mostly grown for the crop as opposed to the flower. But uh, yeah, uh, that is it. If anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Now. Oh, Adam, this. How's it, Brandon? Hi, it's Brandon. I, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, for the, was it the Dendrobium uni, unicum? Yeah. Um, do, do you guys have any, I mean, do you have any that you are willing to sell? Uh, I or, don't, or, but um, wait, you might want to check H&R. H&R. Oh, okay. They might still have. Yep. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Only they will have that one then. 
they're the only ones I know for sure. Yeah. For sure. Oh, okay. But if, if I can, I'll ask around yeah. for you, and I'll, if if uh, I know anybody else, I, I can let you know. I'll get your info. Oh, hey, great. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, no worries, Brendan. It's Holly. I have a couple questions. With sure. how, on the Dendrobium unicum, what was the light and heat thing? I think I missed it. Oh, uh, I may not have put it. Uh, it's it's not anything particular. I think it's, I don't know offhand, let me check. No worries. I think it was the same, or probably just like Hono Hono's where it's um, intermediate light levels and it takes, well, any any of the, the orchids that I, I showed tonight, as far mm -hmm. as temperature, it, it shouldn't be too much of a worry because they grow and bloom in Kailua They'll, they'll grow and bloom where you live, probably. It's probably cooler. OK. And then my other um, question was the Gary Anthony Boringiana. Is that a really big orchid, or? It can get decently sized. Like the, um, the one that won Best in Show at our HOS show, uh, when our last HOS show, um, was maybe like two feet across it, it was it was pretty good size but that that's an old plant you know that was grown by his mother i believe before him oh um, okay i got yeah. time <laughs> it'll take it'll yeah it'll take some time to attain that kind of size great thank you so much yeah no problem thanks adam so interesting by the way um thanks. what do you have your vanilla planted in um, well, they're, they're, the pots that they started in are a dirt mix, but they don't really, that's just like, a, a, a secure for securing them. Really. They, they don't have any real roots in there. They put out their roots into the air. So I just water the, the vegetative parts of the plant as opposed to the pot. Yeah, so as long as you have it on, on something, like they like to grab onto wood, and then you water the whole plant, that'll water it enough. Yeah. My main what call orchid is behind you? Uh, the orchid I have behind me is Rinkolelio Catlea Patricia Leech Almeida. Uh, this is uh, Roy Tokunaga hybridized this 10 years ago and I he allowed me to name this after my mom so ah uh, thanks thank you Adam I'm in Kona and you mentioned that I'm going to kill the name but it's a neobenthamia gracilius yeah um yeah. do you know where we could possibly get them on the big island or any I, place maybe on Oahu or somewhere that would ship to the Big Island? Not sure offhand. Uh, I don't know if Tom knows anybody up there who has that species. Uh, I don't, I haven't seen it up there. Um, uh, so a couple of things. Um, <laughs> I uh, When I first came here, I lived briefly at um, Leonard Gines' uh, abandoned farm. And he has that uh, literally growing right at the entrance. Um, I got a little piece of it there. It cakeys very, very freely. Uh, and so, you know, my piece has gotten pretty, pretty large. Sean, if you want the piece, I can, I can give you a piece. But also, um, you know, you just need to uh, drive down uh, Makuu Drive and and uh, and and stop right in front you don't even have to go in the nursery there's a huge clump of it there so it's one of those plants that that you know just like adam said uh could be used in landscaping and it, it, it just roots everywhere on every stem so so it's a very very easy plant so um just contact me later i'll get you a piece or i'll give you a piece of mine i also adam wanted to um fess up uh, that that um, dendrobium um, 
unicum that you saw at the Hilo show a couple of years ago uh, was not mine. Um, almost everything in that in that display was borrowed from local oh. growers. So so that plant actually belongs to Kai Quintal. And if you right. if you have a relationship with Kai, I mean he has several enormous plants of it, and that's another one that makes cakeies. So uh, I think he, you know, he's a very sweet, generous man. Um, he would probably just give you a piece off of his plant. Right. But don't all call him at once and don't tell him I yeah. said. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Say, Adam, can you describe the groin area at your place? I guess you're uh, in Enchanted yeah. Lakes, right? Yeah, so I, I live in uh, Kilda Hills. It's, I live right up from the shopping center in Kilda Hills. Um, and I have we have a about 800 square foot greenhouse in our backyard, which was initially created to grow anthuriums by my father. Um, now it's about half anthuriums, half orchids. Um, and I also, I grow a bunch of the bandas and, and epidendrons in, uh, on the side of the house and all that. So I try to get them wherever I can. Um, yeah. Having so a greenhouse is, is helps. Is it a greenhouse or do you have Yeah, one? yeah, it's all shade cloth. Okay. Uh, the majority of it is a, like 70 something percent because it's for the anthuriums and they like pretty low light. Um, and then I have like a, a, a runway on, on the back of the greenhouse that's um, thirty five fifty and 85, I think. So it gets darker. It's kind of a mess, but it, it things are alive. That's the main thing. Adam, do you have a sprinkler system? No. Um, I thought about it before, but several things. Uh, I didn't want to go through the effort of having to put it up. And also my dad scared me on it because he told me a s stories about an old Ethereum guy he knew who set up a sprinkler system in his greenhouse and got lazy and, and would not check on his plants for days at a time, went out to check, half his collection was dried up and dead because his sprinkler system broke. And so it's half his too, so he won't let it. Any more questions? If not, thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. That's very interesting information you gave in. Your plants are looking very good and healthy. Thank you, Brandon. You're welcome. Gotta take some pictures, Brandon. <laughs> I know. I know. I got got to take a picture of mine, but my my orchids right now is getting pretty badly burned because the heat. So I gotta stop putting mm. up, put them in the sh underneath the shade cloth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I feel that. Yeah, yeah. Hey, good luck. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much, Adam. That was an outstanding presentation. You're as inspiring to all of us, and the pictures were great. Um, a lot of them are, are a little bit more rare to see, but having seen them, we can try to search for sources for them. And then thank you also for offering keikis, if and when that might be possible. Yeah, so, just... Um, uh... 
most of you should have my email. If you're interested in a neobenthamia gracilis cakey, just send me an email. I'll, we'll figure it out. OK. 